Okay, happy Sabbath. Today is July 3rd, 2021, and we are continuing our studies about the restoration of the sanctuary. We, we know it was started during the time of Zerubbabel with the decree of Cyrus, and then it was stopped during the time of uh, the false, uh, false murders and it was restored again and it continued to be started up again uh, during the uh, time of Darius, all right? And, uh, and continued uh, with uh, Ezra in the time of Artaxerxes, right? Uh, and Artaxerxes gave the third decree, right? And so we've uh, we done uh, Artaxerxes, we uh, Ezra, and we had to defend 457, and that's what we did the last time, um, the the third decree of Artaxerxes and Ezra's return from Babylon, and he came out on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. All right, okay, all right. So now we're going to go to the next phase, which is the rebuilding of the the walls and the and the gates of Jerusalem by Nehemiah all right okay all right uh, let me get to the slide here uh, so this is about Nehemiah and uh, all right Nehemiah which is also called the repairer of the breach the breach has been made, right? It's been the the walls were broken down, the the gates were burned down, and the enemies have come in and uh, destroyed the city and destroyed the destroyed the temple, right? Yeah, uh, so that now it has to be restored. Remember, Zerubbabel restored the temple first, right? And then Ezra came, and he had to restore the services because uh, there had to be priests, Levites, and who else? Nathanims. You know, part of the service includes Nathanims, so the Nathanims also have to come in. And the Nathanims were actually Gentiles, right? Gentiles. So priests, Levites, and Nathanims. But now they they found out that the gates and the walls were still not restored okay oh, so this is about the story of nehemiah we we know the story but uh, we kind of uh had a preview of it on uh, the last time we did it okay and the story of uh, in nehemiah remember nehemiah what was his duty in the 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 courts of the king of persia what was his job the he's the cupbearer right yeah that a high responsibility? Yeah. What the what does the what does the cupbearer do? He had to taste the wine. He's a preventer. Yeah, he's the preventer of. Uh, yeah, he had to make sure there's no poison because if there's poison, what would happen to him? He dies, he dies first. Uh, yeah, so he is very highly trusted, right? Very highly trusted. And so here in Nehemiah 1, verse 1 to 5, you know, he was so sad because he had, you know, we, you can read this, but the story was that he heard from some of the people who had been in Jerusalem that the, the temple there uh, is already rebuilt, but the walls have not been rebuilt, right? And it's the, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the gates are burned with fire. And he was very sad. And the time frame is when? The month of Chislu. This is the ninth month of the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Right? Okay. Right. He was very sad because of the situation that has happened in, in Jerusalem. It, it, it has not been completely restored. It is still languishing in. Uh, languishing. This is the ninth month in the 20th year, right? Right. 
by messengers from Judea. The Hebrew patriot learned that the days of trial had come to Jerusalem, the chosen city. The returned exiles were suffering affliction and reproach. The temple and portions of the city had been rebuilt. Right? Portions of it. Remember, it, was, it had already been rebuilt. But the work of the restoration was hindered. The temple services were disturbed, and the people kept in constant alarm by the fact that the walls of the city were still largely in ruins. All right? Yeah. So then, what he had to do, he had to pray. And then if you read this prayer, you will, re you will be reminded of another prophet who prayed. All right? Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sins against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and we have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that you commandest thou servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were you of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather you. Even though you are scattered, you will now be gathered from thence and will bring them unto a place that I have chosen to set my name there. Whose prayer are you reminded this of? Who prayed for the sin of him and his forefathers? This is Daniel 9. This is the same prayer, right? Because he knew that they had to be scattered for 70 years, right? Yeah. That's right. absolutely. That's exactly it. Yeah, because that's the prayer. And this is, this is, if you break the commandments that's written in the book of Moses, you're going to have to suffer all these things, right? Mm -hmm. and, what, and what was his job? He was the king's cupbearer, right? Because this is found in Leviticus 25, right? And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, this is what Moses wrote. In Leviticus 25, if you do not hearken unto me, but will walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chasten you seven times for your sins. I will scatter you among the heathen. See, I will scatter you. Yes, this is, sorry, this is Leviticus 26, right? Mm. And I will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. This is why the cities are still wasted. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. Her Sabbath has to be enjoyed by the land also. Not only you, but the land has to rest. One year for every seven years, right? Yeah. That's why you have to be in Babylon for 70 years. Okay, it's also in Deuteronomy. Take heed unto yourself, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image for the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that ye shall soon utterly perish from the, off the land wherein ye go over Jordan to possess it. Yet ye, ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. You will be scattered, and the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and sh ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whether the Lord shall lead you. Mm -hmm. See, this is what Moses already wrote. This is what Daniel was praying about, and this is what Nehemiah was praying about, that they have been scattered. But the promise of God is that if you turn back to me, I will gather you back. Even though you're scattered, you will be gathered again. Okay. And First Chronicles 16. And say ye, save us, O God, for our salvation, and what? Yeah. Gather us together. Deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to the, thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Right. So who is it that is now gathered? 
Then shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim. Who's Ephraim now? Who's Israel and who's Ephraim? The ten northern tribes, right? Yeah. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the sides of far off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him. So the Lord already promised, I will gather again Israel or Ephraim. Wait a minute. Wasn't Israel or Ephraim scattered and they were lost? Yeah. They're scattered and they're lost. But they will be gathered again. So how, how does that happen? It's spiritually in our time, right? At Daniel 12, at the end of the 1260, it says, and uh, when the power of the holy people is completely scattered, mm -hmm. all these things. So by the end of 1798, you had God's people being gathered scattered. again. Right. So they will be gathered again, right? It is a spiritual because they are now going to be, the Gentiles are now going to become God's people now. Yeah, these, these were the, gen, they, these 10 kingdoms were scattered among the Gentiles. They were absorbed into the Gentile nations. But now they're going to be gathered again. So out of the Gentiles, these 10 nations will come back again. They will be gathered again, right? Isaiah 11, verse 12 and 13. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah, right? The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversities, adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Ephraim and Judah will now get along. They will all be gathered, right? Judah and Ephraim will be gathered. It's in the end times, you know. This is now talking about the end times, all right? Okay. All right. So let me get to this. All right, so we will see that the words of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah was very sad that uh, he found out that the uh, Jerusalem was not rebuilt. And that was in the ninth month of the 20th year. And then what happened? And it came to pass in the first month of the 20th year that he went into the Artaxerxes and says, Oh, can I go back to Jerusalem? How could it be that he, how could it be that he was so sad in the ninth month and after that, in the first month, he went to the king? How could that happen? The ninth month, he went to the king, he, he became sad and then afterwards he went to the king. How, how could he be sad on the ninth month and then afterwards in the first month of the same year, he went to the king? Is there something wrong and and the evangelical says there's something wrong with how they wrote the bible they said there's something wrong about this because the ninth month cannot come before the first month absolutely we we studied this already right it's just like ezra right so because the reckoning of ezra also is to to have it fit in 457 when he left on the first day of the first month and entered in the fifth day in the fifth month to Jerusalem has to be according to a different reckoning for the Persians, right? The Persians reckon their year starting from spring to spring. Now, how do we reckon our years? If you count, when, when, does, the, when does our year start? What, what, what part of the... It's winter to winter, right? Our calendar is from winter to winter. Right, so the person it's, it's Gregorian, which used to be Julian, right? So in the Julian calendar, which what they used in the time of Jesus, in the time uh, in those days, you know, is Julian calendar, and it is winter to winter. Now the Persians, right? The the kings of Persia, all right. So this is this is the Julian calendar, all right? 
458 BC until 444 BC. This is Julian calendar, winter to winter, January to December, to January again, right? But the Persians counted from spring to spring, right? So here's spring to spring, right? This is the year of Artaxerxes, spring to spring, spring to spring. That's the beginning of their year. So how do the Jews count their civil year? From fall to fall. Okay, so we have the Jewish reckoning is fall to fall here, right? So Ezra came out, all right? Ezra came out on the first day of the first month, right there. First day of the first month. In the seventh year of the king, all right? Here's his here his his seventh year. So according to Ezra, this is his seventh year, right, of the king, because he is reckoning it based on Jewish reckoning. So the first day of the first month, right, and then goes to until the first day of the first month. And it's in four fifty seven. Right? That's why it's four fifty seven in the time of Ezra. And that's the beginning of what time prophecies? 457 is the beginning of two time prophecies. What time prophecy starts in 457 BC? 2300 and? And the 70 weeks. This is very important for our, for Adventists, very important. If we, if we cannot stand on 457, our 2300 days and 70 weeks fall apart, right? And that's going to be a big problem, right? That's why 457 is very important for the Adventists. Okay. All right. For Nehemiah, on what year was it? On the 20th year, right? On the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Okay. This is the 20th year here. So it's in this 20th year because Nehemiah is still reckoning from fall to fall, right? All right. So Chislu of the 20th year is happens before Nisan, right? Chislu is before Nisan. The ninth month is actually before the first month in the 20th year. So what year did Nehemiah go back to Jerusalem? 444 BC. 444 BC. Ezra went back in 457, right? Nehemiah is in 444 BC. All right? Okay. All right. And what did he do there? He had to rebuild the walls. Okay. So the rest of the time here, we are going to study the rebuilding of the walls. Now you can also open in Nehemiah chapter 3. So we're going to we're going to uh, first do a summary of the walls, right? But the walls of Jerusalem typifies the walls of New Jerusalem, right? The walls of New Jerusalem, right? So we we go uh see the significance of these walls. Right? What do these walls mean? Right? And I'm sorry, the gates of Jerusalem. The gates of what does the gates of Jerusalem? This is the this is the eastern wall of uh, Jerusalem now, and the most famous gate on that eastern wall is this gate right here. That is, that is uh, closed, and it was closed by the, the Muslims, right? Because the Jews say that one day Jesus is going to come through which gate? The eastern gate. This is the eastern gate. So the Muslims, they... They, they, they put the gates, right? They just uh, block those, those gates. And these gates has never been opened since. Uh, uh, the Jews or Christians? Uh, the Jews, uh, the, the Muslims. Uh, yeah. The Christians expect that Yeah. Not the Jews. No, uh, uh, well, the Jews also. The Christians also believe that Jesus will come through this gate. Right? The Eastern Gate. This is called the Eastern Gate or the Golden Gate. And this is on the Muslim side now. 
Oh, this, and uh, these are all uh, burials right here. Why do people want to be buried here? Because Jesus is going to come. They say Jesus is going to come and then enter right there. I want to be buried right there. So that I, when I'm, when I'm uh, what, uh, resurrected, I will see Jesus come right there. All these are graves right here. Yeah, it's a huge cemetery right there. Yeah, just what they, they all want to, they, they just want to, they say, Jesus is going to come through here. I'm going to be buried right here. So this is, yeah, they want a front row seat. Uh, this is, this, this is, a, this is called the Eastern Gate. Okay. What is that based off? What, what is, I'm trying to think of, there's got to be a scripture that they can Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll go through there, right? We, yeah, we'll, we go through there. We go through these gates, okay? All right. So these gates of Jerusalem, right? Uh, what do these gates represent, all right? Enter ye into the straight gate. The strength enter ye into the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Because narrow is the gate and straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, right? So who's the way and the life? Yeah, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So these gates represent who? It represents Christ. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And what about uh, the gates of New Jerusalem in heaven? Right. How many gates are there? Twelve. Twelve. Twelve right. Is in Revelation 21, yeah. right? And what do those 12 gates mean? What do they represent? The, tribes, the, the 12, the 12 the tribes. tribes of the children of Israel. The 12 tribes. And they have characters, right? Yeah, they have characters, but they also need, it represents the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, right? Okay, so now we go through these gates. All right, this is, a, this is the old gate that was built by, at the time of Nehemiah, all right? And this, this is the sheep gate, fish gate, old gate, this is valley gate. But th this, this is added on. This is added on later on, okay? And the, the, the current gate is over here now. Right? Except this east gate is now over here, and the gates that we see now is on this wall here. So this this gate here is no longer here. This is this is you you can only find remnants of it. But this part here is down here is still you can still see it. So if you go around this gate here, you can walk around here and then see this part here is still there, and this is the gates that you can walk around of right right here. This part here is gone. You can't see this anymore, right? But this was the gate part here. It was that was uh, rebuilt by uh, Nehemiah, right? So we go the gates of Jerusalem, right? If you go to Nehemiah three, the first gate that is mentioned is the sheep gate, right? Uh, I give the reference, verse one and thirty-two. Here's the sheep gate right there. This is the sheep gate. Right, this is the sheep gate. Uh, and the next gate is the fish gate. There you go, fish gate. Right, and that, uh, it, it just keeps going. Fish gate is in verse three. And then what's the next gate? Old gate. The old gate. And you have an old gate there, verse six, which is unto the broad wall and the tower of the furnaces. All right, so here's you know uh, the old gate. And what's the next gate? The valley gate. Valley. There's the valley gate right there. All right. All right. The valley gate. And so it goes, what? Counterclockwise. Right? He, he goes counterclockwise. Uh, sheep, fish, old, uh, valley. All right. That's verse 13. All right. And then dung gate. gate. All right. Dung gate. Why is it called the dung gate? Yeah, this is where you uh, take out all the refuse 
refuse, you know, uh, the, the, <laughs> yeah, all the, all the waste from the city and it's thrown out through this gate down into the valley, right? So eventually that valley becomes shallow. <laughs> There's not much of a valley there. The biggest valley is on this side. This is no longer a valley here because it's full of, well, you want to, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the dung gate. All right, okay, then the next gate is what? The fountain gate. Now this is near the pool of Shiloh here, right? The, the fountain gate is the full, near the pool of Shiloh, uh, and then the water gate, uh, after the turning of the wall and offal. Oh, this is the water gate. This is where they get the water to bring up. From this water, they have to bring, the water is brought up from here and it's brought up into the, this is the, uh, this is the area of the, um, the, uh, the temple, right? The temple complex is right here. This is the temple. So the water has to be brought up. And the people who work here, are the Nethanims. They live in Ophel, right? Because they're the ones that work and they have to bring the water and they bring have to the water. They're the manual laborers and these are the Nethanims. And the Nethanims live in Ophel, which is near the water gate because that's their job is to bring water and, and uh, all those things that is necessary for the services, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is the water gate. After that, there's the horse gate, right? Horse gate. All right. And then you have the east gate, right? That's the east gate, remember? The big gate that is now blocked, right? That's the east gate. And then the, and then there's the Mifkad gate, which is called Muster gate. Mifkad gate, all right? Now we, we're gonna, the problem is that how many gates were restored? Count the gates. No. There's 10. Uh, this is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, I'm counting the gates. So how many gates were restored? 10. How many gates are in Jerusalem? Where's the other two? Uh, 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 hold on, hold on. Now, if you go, this is where a lot of those who teach about Nehemiah, they miss this. Because if you go to chapter 12, verse 39, when they dedicate the gates, there's two other gates that were dedicated but not restored. And one of them is called... The gate of Ephraim. Mm -hmm. All right. It's, it's what? It's, you know, when you look at the gate of Ephraim, you go to, uh, go to uh, Nehemiah 12, 12, verse 39. Read that then. From above the gate of Ephraim and above the old gate. So the gate of Ephraim and then old gate and then? Old gate and above the fish gate and the tower of Hananiel and the tower of the gate. See, there you go. So the gate of Ephraim is after the old gate and the fish gate and the sheep gate. So the sequence is sheep, fish, old, and then gate of Ephraim. Right? Okay. And there's another gate. And then after that, sheep gate and then? And they stood still in the prison gate. And then after that, after the sheep gate is what, another one called the prison gate. But remember, this is like a Right? So the prison gate is actually between the sheep gate and the muster gate. So it's actually the... It's another gate here. It's called the prison gate. Right? So there's actually 10 gates are restored. Two does not have to be restored. And these represents the 12 tribes. Ten have to still be restored. What does that mean? That's right. Judah was restored. Remember? But eventually, the ten have to still be restored, right? 
eventually at the end time, 10 have to be restored still, right? These are the 10 tribes that still have to be restored, right? Yeah. Judah and Benjamin have been restored, right? They came back from Babylon. They were restored. But the 10 tribes will still have to be restored, right? They still have to be restored. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty. It, it's, all, it's prophetic, right? These are prophecies. Okay, the thing about it is, these are, he actually restored it, he actually mentioned it one at a time. And then when you look at the Bible studies about these, these uh, gates, you will see that this is, people will actually see the meanings of sheep gate and fish gate and old and all these and attribute it to the Christian walk of how you are going to be restored to God. But when you look it into deeper, this is actually the restoration of the 144,000, right? Because the, the, Jesus called his disciples, right? And he called his disciples and eventually his disciples uh, became the Christian church. And then now the, then eventually the, it's going to be called, the 144,000 is going to be called out of the out of the remnant of this church, the church, and then be restored. The ten tribes are going to be restored with the two tribes, and they become the 144,000. All right. So we will see what this sequence of gate means in the prophetic uh, restoration of the 144,000. All right. Uh, there has to be a, b a deeper meaning to this. All right, so this is where we're gonna, uh, what we are gonna do now. Okay, the sheep gate. The first is the sheep gate. All right. Let's see what does what do you think the sheep gate means? All right. Then Eliashib means God will restore, which is the high priest. All right. He rose up with his brethren, the priest, and he built the sheep gate. So it's the high priest and the priest that built the sheep gate and they sanctified it. And they, and they went even the tower of Mia, a hundred, which means a hundred. And they sanctified it under the tower of Hananiel and God has favored, which is, means the grace of God. All right. So if you want to just go with this and try to find out every meaning of these uh, towers, you will find out, okay, it could mean that uh, the, the priests have to sanctify the sheep with the grace of God. Wow. Yeah. There's actually a lot of meaning that you can find from this, but we want to find out what it means prophetically with the work of Jesus in restoring his church because he came down to earth and he had to restore his church, right? Right. He had to restore his church. Okay. When you see the sheep gate, this is where they brought the sheep through this gate and they had to bring it to the temple because this is where the temple had, you know, had to have all these services and they had to sacrifice all the sheep, right? So the sheep had to be brought through this sheep gate, right? And then Jesus had to be brought in like the sheep. So they said, oh, it is through this sheep gate that Jesus actually had to come. And then he was crucified and when and he was uh had gone through the tribunals right mm -hmm. right okay it's because jesus was brought in as a sheep right the next day john sees jesus coming unto him and says behold the lamb of god right and isaiah says you know he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before her shears to dumb so he openeth not his mouth this is when Jesus was shown as the Lamb of God, right? This first time that the, uh, John the Baptist says, okay, this is now Jesus. He is the Lamb of God, right? Jesus is identified as the Lamb of God. And then Jesus also in John 5, right? 
there was a feast of the Jews and he went into Jerusalem and there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called Bethesda and what did he do there he healed the person that was lame right the wall the the water was shaken and that per, and that was near the pool of Bethesda you can still go to that pool it's called the pool of Bethesda it's near the sheep gate and so this is the sheep gate now right and for for those who want to walk the the walk of the Via de Ro, uh, de, uh, Via de la Rosa the first station is at near the sheep gate All right so you start off at the sheep gate because they said okay Jesus this is where Jesus entered so you want to walk the walk of Jesus you start with the sheep gate right because Jesus entered as the sheep and for us we know that with his ministry he is identified as the Lamb of God and what happened to him then he was then he was yeah he was baptized and then he started ministering right all right after he was baptized right after he baptized what did he do he had to call his disciples and what did he call his disciples to do all right and he called his disciples and said come ye after me and i will make make you fishers of men that's why there's a fish gate right he's identified as the lamb of god and then he calls his disciples to become fishers of men right and acts 2 and what did peter say repent and be ye baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost you have to be baptized in whose name Jesus, right? Name of Jesus. This is one of the word, verses where we can defend that you have to baptize in one authority, and it's the authority of Jesus, right? The, pro, the promise is unto you and you and your children, right? You have to be baptized, right? And this is where the, the Jesus call, tells his disciples that you have become fishers of men, and Peter had to baptize. Uh, all the all the followers right in the name of Jesus okay so this is the fish gate now the fish gate is you know it's really not the fish gate of the old but now in the area of the north the biggest gate there is the uh, Damascus gate this is the large gate uh, the the big uh, the all the buses uh, that come from the north, they come to this place right here. It's called the Damascus Gate. This is the large gate uh, now in Jerusalem. Now, it's called the Damascus Gate. This is not ob this is not the old Fish Gate, right? Okay, but you can see that this is now. We can see that this is now the life of Jesus. Now, right? He was identified as the Lamb of God, and then he called his disciples to become fishermen. Fishers of men. And then what about the old gate? Moreover, the old gate repaired Jedoiah. What did they have to do with the old gate, right? Okay, through this old gate, we have, you know, we have an altar where they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. And Jesus that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the camp. He had to be crucified outside the outside Jerusalem, right? And to go out on the northern northwestern. There's a gate that you have to go out for which you can go to Calvary or Golgotha. And it's through the old gate, right? Is through the old gate, right? Yeah, so Jesus, you have to go through that old gate. Why is it called the old gate? I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old. I will meditate also all thy work and talk of thy things. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, right? Is in the wonders of old, right? So Jesus had to restore the sanctuary to the old sanctuary. 
what did he have to do after he called his disciples and they went to Cana and they went to Galilee, they went back and they went back to Jerusalem and what did Jesus have to do with the sanctuary? He had to restore it. He restored it to the old sanctuary because they had desecrated it, right? They had desecrated the sanctuary and he had to return it, right? After this, I will return. I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof. I will set it up, right? Known unto God for all his works from the beginning of the world. I have to re restore the sanctuary. So Jesus has to restore the sanctuary to the sanctuary of old, right? So this is why... His next, the next step is the old gate. He had to restore the old paths, which is the good way, and walk therein. Ye shall find rest. But they say, we will not walk in. Jesus had to restore the old, old, the sanctuary that has been defiled, and he had to restore it to the old ways, to the old path. Jesus came to this temple. And when he cleansed, when he overthrew the tables of the money changers, he said, it is written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made a den of thieves, right? Yeah. And even, and when even was come, he went out of the city, right? He went out of the city because, because he, and then he left that, he, he left that place that that house that he had to clean, he had to return it to the old path. All right. So what's the next? What's the next? It's now the gate of Ephraim. Ephraim is now the ten lost tribes. What the ten lost tribes have become Gentiles, right? After he cleansed the temple, and he says, "This is now. It is used to be my house. It is now." becomes your house. Who did he go out and meet? He met the Greeks, right? He met the Gentiles. And he actually ministered to the Gentiles. Now, there's multiple uh, instances in the Bible that he, uh, he actually ministered to the Gentiles. One of them is at the, at the well of Jacob, remember? The woman at Samaria. Another one is the woman of uh, the woman of Canaan, right? Who came and he uh, Sanda, uh, uh, what uh, cleansed the son out of uh, uh, out of uh, uh, the devils cast out the devil, and this woman says, "Wait a minute, I also want the blessings, right?" But then she she identified herself. If the Jews can have the food then the dogs can also have the crumbs right right so jesus was ministering also to the gentiles right and this is another instance right here right but i tell you the truth many widows were in the israel in the days of elias when the heaven was shut up three days and six months when great famine was throughout all the land but unto none of them was Elias sent. Elias was not sent to, to the Jews. Save unto Zarepta, the city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow, who was a Gentile. Right? Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed. Save who? Naaman. Right? So this is represents Ephraim, the Gentiles, right? Yeah. The Gentiles are also being saved, right? And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to his worship at the feast, remember? Right? So Jesus, after he had cleansed the temple and he says, this is no longer my house, this is your house, and your house is left desolate, who did he go out and meet? The Greeks, right? That is, represents the gate of Ephraim now, right? The Gentiles. Okay, what's the next? What's the next gate? The valley gate. Okay, the valley gate. Okay, after this, 
what happened to Jesus? That you could think that he has to go at the experience of the valley. <coughs> Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Jesus now has to go through the, his tribulation time before he goes to the, to the, to the what? To the, uh, to Calvary, right? He has to go through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. And Ellen White says, Jesus has to experience the fulfillment of Psalms 23. He has to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Have the gates of death been opened unto me? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of the shadow of death? Right? This, uh, Jesus has to go through his trials and tribulations going get ready to get ready to be crucified on the cross he has, has to go through the valley of the shadow of death right? and it's uh, it's like the the what of uh, job the the experience of jesus is like the experience of job because job was praying i went down to the bottom of the mountains the earth with her bars was about me forever he was in the depth of the ocean, like in the bottom of the mountains. He was in the valleys. Uh, Jonah. Uh, sorry, Jonah, sorry. Like Jonah, right? Jonah was in the belly of the whale, right? That was like in the valley of death, in the valley of the shadow of death. This is also the experience of Jesus. All right. What's the next one? After the valley gate is the? Dung gate. Oh boy. How can you connect this with Jesus? The dung gate. The experience of Jesus with the dung gate. All right. The only way that I, the one way that we can figure this, how you connect this with Jesus is that during the sacrifice of the, of the animals, the animals were sacrificed, the blood and the fat was burned. What was left? The body and the dung. What happened to the body and the dung of the animal? Was taken out of the camp. Was taken out of the camp, which had been taken out of the city and burned outside, right? That represents Jesus, right? Yeah. Jesus was taken out of the city of Jerusalem and he was crucified. He had to die. His body had to die and he had to be buried outside of the city. His flesh had to die, right? His flesh. That's right, yeah. His death, the death of Jesus had to be outside of the gate, right? The, like the dung gate. The flesh and his dung had to be brought out of the city. And the skin of the bullock and all his flesh and his head and with his legs and his inwards and his dung. Even the whole bullock shall be carried forth outside without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burned on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out and he shall be burned. This is what happens to the sacrifice. The body and the flesh and the dung have to be brought out, right? It's like the dung gate, right? The flesh of Jesus had to be brought out. Who shall change your vile body that we may make, be fashioned like unto his glorious body? And then his glorious body, his, his body that was sinful flesh was buried outside the gate. And then it had to be glorified when it was resurrected on the third day, right? Yeah. Behold, I show a mystery. Ye shall not all sleep, but ye shall all be changed. Because Jesus was changed. We are glorified just the way Jesus was glorified. So his body that was buried outside, his sinful flesh was buried, and then it was glorified. Right? So that represents the dung gate. Right. Okay, what's the next gate? The gate of the fountain. All right. Wow. The gate of the fountain. After Jesus was resurrected, 
And then he went to heaven. Ten days later. And what did he do? He sent down the comforter, right? He sent the outpouring of the Holy Spirit like a fountain, right? It's like a fountain now, right? I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground and I pour my spirit, right? It's the water that is flowing like a fountain. That is water. This is now flowing water, right? like a fountain at the Pentecost, right? Like a precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's head. Like the dew of Hermon that went down to Zion, even the life forevermore, right? This is like how Aaron was anointed. The oil runs down his beard. And when it runs down his beard, what does it fall on? His breast and his clothes. It's what's on the his clothes. The 12 tribes, right? It comes down on the, right? He has those 12, right? The breastplate. The breastplate. It falls right on the, on his, the, on his people, on the 12 disciples, right? Right? It falls down all on him. It's like the Holy Spirit is being poured down on his disciples, right? Like the dew of Hermon that descended upon the mountains of Zion. So the ointment falls, pours down, right? So this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? The time of Pentecost. Okay, the next, oh, okay, let's see. And Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them, and he says, Receive you the Holy Ghost. His breath is his life, and that the dew of Hermon is like unto life. And it is the Holy Ghost that was breathed unto his disciples. On the day of Pentecost, the cloven tongues like as of fire, came down with a sound of rushing mighty wind, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay. All right. What's the next gate? It's the water gate. Okay. So you have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but then you have the water gate. Hmm. Water gate means now... It's not uh, no longer out, uh, outpouring, but now you have the water. You have the Holy Ghost within you. So now you have the impartation of the nature of Christ in you. So now you have Christ already dwelling in you. All right? That he would grant you according to riches of his glory, to be strengthened with his might by his spirit, in the inner man, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love, right? And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that may that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is my, made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The power of Christ is the fullness of God that dwells in me. So that's the water that is in me. So Christ in me that gives me the power and the knowledge and the life that is within me, right? So that's the water gate. Now, Jesus now is in heaven. Now he's able to uh, send his spirit. And now that the, the, the life of Jesus is now in his church. All right. What's the next gate? Oh, the spirit, which is the words, which is the life. All right. Okay. Oh, I still have more, right? The knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are we given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, 
that by these we might be partakers of the, the divine nature. And we are renewed in the knowledge of the image of him that created him. Right? Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free. But Christ is all and in all. So this is uh, the water gate, right? Christ is in all. Christ is all and in all. All right. Okay. The water gate. And I'm sorry, now the horse gate. Okay, what is the, what does horse mean? Well, yeah, it's a, well, obviously it's a horse, but prophetically, what, it, what could it mean? All right. <laughs> he delighteth not in the strength. Oh, it's his strength, right? It's power, not the pleasure in the legs of man, right? So it's the strength. Hmm, okay, what else? What does horse mean? The horse rusheth into battle. Okay, it's a strength and in battle now. Okay, it's talking about battle and power, right? That's a horse, right? We're trying to find from the Bible here. What does horse mean? Okay. I return and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor to the battle. So it is also a race because you you race the horse, you go to battle with the horse, and you go because the horse has power, right? So it's about race and, and battle. Right. Brethren, I can't not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting these things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the price, of the high calling of God in Christ. I have fought a good fight and finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now you have to battle, right? The horse means that you are in a battle. And you know that the battle is not against, it's against principalities, right? So you have to have this horse. The horse to finish the race, to finish the fight, to go through the battle, right? To fight a good fight, to finish a course. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. This is Revelation 9. And these, these armies gathered where? The beast, the false prophet, and the, the dragon, they gathered at Armageddon, right? in an army to fight against God's people, right? Yeah. These are the horses, right? So it's, uh, uh, these are the horses, right? Okay, after the, horse, after the horse gate, see, this is a warfare, right? This is a race, it's a warfare. Okay, after that, what happens? What's the next gate after the, this? Mustard. <laughs> Not before, before muster, right? The east gate. Okay, what happens? What's the east gate? This is not difficult. What's the east gate? What happens through after all these things after the after the Armageddon and then what happens after that? Jesus comes back, right? The east gate, right? The east gate is actually Mizra, means sun rising. The sun rising in the east, right? The east gate. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise. The Son of Righteousness will arise where? In the East, right? Arise, Son of Righteousness, will, Jesus will arise in the East. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify you unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star or orithrinos or the dawn the day dawn the star the morning star what is the morning star 
the brightest star in the east that comes out before the sun is actually the planet Venus, right? It's planet Venus. It is only seen, it's seen very bright in the, before the dawn. So that's the, it rises up, right? That's the, that's the morning star. And that represents Jesus also. Because Jesus will rise up and eventually become the son of righteousness. So become, first it becomes, you know, it because it's, it's a darkness and then there's a star that comes up and then eventually the sun will rise up and become brighter and brighter and brighter, right? So that represents Jesus, okay? Jesus is the morning star. Jesus is also the son of righteousness and they come out, out of the east, right? All right. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So when Jesus comes, he will come from the where? He's going to come in the east. Like the lightning. He's going to be the bright and morning star. He's going to be the morning star. And he's the Son of Righteousness that arises. All right, That's why he comes out from the east. You know, the problem is that Satan also wants to represent so wants to uh, copycat Jesus, right? Yeah, he is, he is a counterfeit of Jesus, right? Yeah. And here is in Jeremiah 19. And go forth unto the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the east gate, right? The valley of Hinnom is near the entry of the east gate. What's the significance of the valley of Hinnom, which is near the east gate? What happens there? And they built high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom. They built the, the altars of Baal to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech. They have child sacrifice near the east gate which I command them not, neither came into unto my mind, they shall do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And now therefore, saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this, wherefore it shall be delivered unto the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, and by famine, and by pestilence. Because you have done this at the east gate. You, did do, you do this right at the east gate, right? The east gate is supposed to represent Jesus coming back. But you do the, all these abominations near the east gate. Yeah. And what happens the, with the fourth abomination in Ezekiel 8? What do the 25, I mean, about 25 men do? They turn their back from the temple of the Lord and they face toward the east and what do they do they worship the sun toward the east right and who's also called the son of the morning how art thou fallen from heaven O lucifer son of the morning lucifer means morning star he's the son of the morning wow and this is why people worship the sun on the Sunday, right? Because Lucifer wants to be worshipped like the, because he's also, he wants to be worshipped just like Jesus, right? Okay, all right. What's the, what's the next one after Eastgate? Uh, you, you actually said that, the Mifkad. Gate Mifkad. Okay, what's Mifkad? Which is muster, right? Mifkad means muster, right? What does that mean? Mifkad means mandate, appointment, visit, muster, charge, avenge, or judgment, right? There's, there's, there's going to be a judgment time after Jesus comes. Okay, there's going to be a judgment, right? It means judgment. Muster is judgment, right? Remember Revelation 11, right? These are all in sequence. 
and the nations were angry, and then thy wrath is come, and then the time of the dead that they should be judged. Right? The time of the dead that should be judged is after the wrath, after the seven last plagues. Right? After Jesus comes, and then will be the time of the judgment for the wicked dead. For how long? For 1,000 years. So the judgment for 1,000 years. The gate of Mifgad is the judgment day after the gate of the east. So there's going to be, after Jesus comes, there's going to be a time of judgment for the wicked dead. The gate of Mifgad. There, for we must all appear before the judgment. All must appear before the judgment, right? And the judgment is for a, a thousand years for the wicked dead, Revelation 20, okay? For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them unto the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, even the what? The angels will be judged during that time, right? The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, right? And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment, right? Even the Ethiopians and the Ninevites will judge Jerusalem, right? Because those who have repented will judge those who have not repented right? during the 1,000 years. Okay, and what's the, what's, the, what's the last gate? The prison gate, right? So what's the last gate? The prison gate. What's the prison? Where's, this, where's the prison that's associated with the 1,000 years? Yeah, right here, right? Revelation 20, right? And the angel came down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, which is abusos, which is depthless. And a great chain was in his hand. And what did he do? He bound the dragon, right? For a thousand years. And he was cast into the bottomless pit. And we shut him up and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years shall be filled. And after that, he must be loosed a little. And when the thousand years are expired, <coughs> Satan shall be loosed out of his, his prison. Right? So that's his prison. All right. Okay. And this is when? This is typified by Aaron putting his hands upon the Azazel goat and sending him out into the wilderness. And the wilderness means abyss, right? Wilderness means abyss where there's nothing there, right? Which is the, which is the bottomless pit, right? right? The bottomless pit. And we remember this is in Genesis 1 verse 2. And the earth was without form. Without form means wilderness or the desert and is void means emptiness right he will have to go back to that emptiness and void that was like as if the earth was not even formed so it started with a void it's gonna end with a void right yeah it's it's amazing right yeah so now we will put this into timeline because we can see this is like all is chronological, right? That's why Nehemiah had to mention it chronological, all right? The gates of Jerusalem, right? It starts with the sheep gate, fish gate, all right? Old gate, gate of Ephraim. I put this in yellow because this was, uh, yeah, the one that was not mentioned in Ephra, uh, Nehemiah 3, but was, was mentioned in Nehemiah 12. But when you add it all up, you have 12 gates. Right? East gate, gate, Mikfat, Mifkat, and then prison gate. All right? I have to, 
I have to pick out, uh, this is basically uh, the ministration, starts with the ministration of Jesus. He is identified as the Lamb of God when he was baptized, right? By John the Baptist. The Baptist. Here is the Lamb of God, right? Who will take away the sins of the world. And then he had to call his disciples and make them fishers of men, right? And then he had to restore the, the temple to the old ways, right? He has to restore the temple. And then he gave his kingdom also to the Gentiles, the Greeks, right? Right? The Ephraim is, represents the Gentiles. And then he had to go through the valley, right, of tribulation, right? Right? And he had to die on Calvary. And then he was resurrected, right? His flesh, his fle uh, sinful flesh was then glorified outside the walls of Jerusalem, right? It was as, as if his, his flesh and dung was burned outside and his body was glorified outside the gate, right? He was resurrected outside the gate. Okay, all right. And then the fountain gate, that's it, all right. And then he, <laughs> he sent his comforter, right? At the time of Pentecost, so that his, his followers will have received the Holy Ghost in them and they can have the experience of Christ in them. But then they also have to go through the time of tribulations where they have to uh, go through a... Uh, face the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, who will all go through uh, uh, the, the time of trials, right? And the race that eventually leads to the coming of Jesus at the East Gate, right? Jesus will come through the, uh, will come uh, representing the East Gate and will start the judgment for the wicked who are still dead at that time, right? And I, I put that as the, they have to read their names and their deeds that are written in the scrolls in the books in heaven, right? That's the judgment for a thousand years. And then Satan, Satan is let loose from the prison where he had been and he will be destroyed with all his followers. So you see this, this all shows his, Jesus starts here where he gathers his 12 disciples. And then the 144,000 will all be gathered. Not only that, not only will all the 144,000, but all the enemies of God will be destroyed, even Satan and his followers. And then will the covenant be, be, uh, uh, be fulfilled, right? See, the covenant was given even in the beginning of time. And then it was repeated to Abraham and repeated to uh, 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 Enoch. And uh, it, was in, it was given again uh, uh, to Moses. But then it had to be ratified at the at the at the, uh, at the time that when Jesus was cut off in the midst of the week, he had to ratify the covenant here, right? Because for a covenant to be, to be made, uh, to be ratified, uh, there has to be a cutting of a sacrifice. That's why Jesus had to be sacrificed here. But then Jesus had to sacrifice so that he can gather back his, his remnant, his 144,000. And then he will have to make them his, the enemies, his footstool. And all the enemies of God and Satan and his angels were all then eventually destroyed, right? And he will take them, return them back to, back to, back to earth. And it comes down, comes down where? At the Mount of Olives, right? Okay. Well, this actually, not far from the Mount of Olives, is this picture taken because right above here is a, 
is a, a, a hill right behind this place where this picture is taken. That's the Mount of Olives, right? This is not from the, not far from the Mount of Olives. So prophetically, we can see that all these gates represents the restoration of God's people, right? God's church, the restoration of his temple. All right. Wow. All right. That's a, and that is a more sure word of prophecy.